guys how you all doing. If you guys will turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, we will be in chapter 11. We are going to cover verses 1 through 16. This is one of those passages that's always semi-uncomfortable because we're going to be dealing with women and insubordination. <laughs> insubordination. <laughs> And, you know, but it, it, it's biblical, and there's an order that God has set forth in humanity and all his creation that is there for purpose and there for reason. And even areas like this that can be uncomfortable are beneficial, not only to women, but also to us men. It puts perspective on everything that God has given and that God has done. Nothing that God has set in order was just put there to be there. It was there for purpose, and it will remain there for purpose, and its purpose will always <laughs> be for the benefit of us. It will always be for the benefit of His glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for being God. We thank You for who You are, Lord. We honor You and we glorify Your name. We lift Your name high. This service is about You, the, Your Word. It's about You. The worship, it's to You, Lord. It's all to You. May we never stop looking to You, Jesus. We just give everything we have to You this morning. We surrender all. We ask that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit fresh this morning with insight, with wisdom, with understanding, Lord, that we would know you, but that we would not lack compassion and grace, Lord, that we would look like you to every aspect of our lives, from our words, our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, our walk, the way we view life, Lord, would we see it through your eyes. May we be transformed and conformed to your image. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we get into verse 1, we want to remember what Paul has been talking about. He's been going over the Christian freedoms. He's been going over how we are free in Christ to operate, not how we want, but how we want within the limits that God has given us as, as believers. You know, it, there are certain things that are black and white, sacrificing to idols. It's black and white. The Bible's clear, don't do that. Um, sexual immorality, it's black and white. The Bible says, don't do that. Um, being a drunkard, it's black and white. The Bible says don't do that. But there's all these other areas that aren't black and white. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say most of the Christian life is in the gray area. And trying to define those gray areas is, you know, where we get so many weird sects of Christianity. S-E-C-T-S, -E sect. Not sex, sectus. <laughs> and, you know, but that's where we get so many weird sects from is because these gray areas are gray and we want to do the honorable thing with the Lord. We always want to do the, what's honorable. But, Lord, do we go this way? Do we go that way? I mean, what, what's the more honorable way? And, you know, Paul has been very vivid on you're free in Christ. You know, we're not to sacrifice to gods. But he says if somebody else has sacrificed to a false god and then they sold the meat in the market, remember what he says? He says you're good to eat it. Just ask no questions. Enjoy the meat. <clears throat> If the person that you're with, they're buying the meat and they say, hey, this was sacrificed to Zeus, he says, don't eat it. Not because the meat's bad, but for the sake of the conscience of the one who's telling you it was sacrificed. Because if they're telling you it's sacrificed, then by you partaking, you're saying, hey, I partake in items. That, you partake in a sacrificial ritual. And Paul says, don't do that for the conscience of them, for their weak mind, so that they don't fall into the hindrance of worshiping false idols again that's paul's case this whole time for like the last two chapters he's been on and on about that and going on about the liberty and the christian and paul concluded last week with i die to myself i'll give up my liberties if it's going to be for the benefit of others i'm going to give up my liberties for the holiness of god if it means god is going to be honored by me giving up my liberty i give it up freely and so i say that because when we get into verse one it almost doesn't fit in chapter 11. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. It's this, you guys have been with me long enough. I'll repeat it anyway because it's good to know. 1227 AD, you guys remember what happened? Anybody? A man by the name of Stephen Langton put the chapter breaks in the Bible. So for the first 1,200 years since Jesus, at least since the New Testament, there were no chapter breaks. It was just... You, you read a scroll, and that's what it is. If you wanted to find a piece of Isaiah, you just you know, flipped through it till you recognized the area. Okay, it's somewhere around here, and you kept reading. There it is, all right. And that's why in synagogues, and they would go read, the scrolls would be preset. Otherwise, you'd spend 20 minutes trying to find where your, where your passage is. 
And then in 1551, another guy by the name of Robert Stephanus came along and he put verses into the Bible. And so the chapter breaks and the verse breaks, although extremely beneficial, there is no real significance spiritually to them. They're just, they're great. Because then I can tell you, turn to 1 Corinthians 11 and we, you know, we all, it takes us 10 seconds to get there because we, we can navigate it quickly with it. So we, 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 we're thankful for the chapter breaks. We're thankful for the verse breaks, but we always want to remember they're not a part of the inspired original text. Which means whoever put them there, that was their opinion. And sometimes they didn't put them in the best of places. And so when we look at verse 1 of chapter 11, it probably better categorizes with the end of chapter 10. How does chapter 10 end? Whether then, verse 31 of 10, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense, either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men and all things not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many so that they may be saved. Now, obviously, as we've been going through the book of Corinthians, we find that many of the people in the church of Corinth were extremely immature. They were an immature church. They were not matured the way they were to be matured. They are still sipping on the milk, Paul tells them. You guys are drinking. You guys should be teachers by now. And then verse 1, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Well, what was Paul doing? Paul just got through saying, whether then you eat or drink, do whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, give no offense either to the Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, just as I also please all men and all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many so that they may be saved. So he tells them, you guys are immature, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Now, why would Paul tell them to imitate him? For the sake that they're immature. As you guys know, i got a baby boy. He's almost 11 months. And he can't do a whole lot on his own. He's learning. He's experimenting. You know, his new fad is he likes throwing stuff. <laughs> Somewhat of a pain in the butt, especially when in the store. Just, phew, when you see something go flying, like, oh, <laughs> got to go grab that, put it back in. Phew, throws it out. And you know, I, I'm like a gopher now. You know, and, and, and but, you know, what he does, well, I, mean, I don't know if he learned that from me or if he's just experimenting. I just wanted to share that with you guys out of intimacy. But one thing I'm learning about my son is he's starting to copy my wife and I, whatever it is we do. If I go, la, 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 you know what he does? La, 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 la. If I go, <laughs> you know what he does? <laughs> if I go, peekaboo, you know what he does? He gets the blanket. And he just has a blast doing it. And he copies us. And as he's trying to walk, he doesn't know how to walk. But if I hold his little hands, he can walk. And if I do things with him, he can do them. If I help him bounce, he can jump up and down. And he's imitating me to certain degrees because he's not yet able to do them. That's Paul's plea to the Corinthians. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Not because Paul was something worthy to be imitated. It's because the Corinthians couldn't walk yet. They were immature. They were just a bunch of little dirty diaper children. And that's where they're at. And there is a real, I don't want to say need, for people imitating godly men as they imitate Christ. The goal is never to imitate somebody else. It's never the goal. The goal is always to imitate Christ. Your goal in life isn't to follow me, but it's to follow Christ. You guys are to have your own walk with the Lord. My son, he's going to imitate my walk with Jesus until he's old enough to understand it on his own. That's just what it's going to be. It's how it is if you guys have ever raised kids, you know, they follow mom and dad and they raise their hands if they raise their hands and they get a, take their little Bible because mom and dad have their Bible. But they get to a place in their own walk where they have to come to grounds with who God is, where they have to come to this realization that Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I am a sinner. And... I need to be forgiven of my sin. So they have to come to their own walk. Till that time comes, they're dependent on our walk. They're dependent on our words and our actions and reactions. And everything we do reverberates into their life and through their life. Everything, whether you like it or not, good or bad. Again, the Corinthians, the immaturity that they had, they weren't able to walk the way a Christian ought to have walked. So he leaves them with this. Imitate me. Be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Now, this word imitate is a cool word. I liked it, so I'm going to tell you what it is. It's the Greek word mimetes. Now, there should be a word in there that sounds familiar. M-I-M-E-T-E-S. Mime. 
It's where the word mime comes. We get our word mime from. In the ancient world, a mime in ancient Greece and Rome, mimes would mimic people. That's what they would do. They were mimics. And they did they they mimicked people as a form of entertainment. Yes, they would also they're quiet and they'd do the whole box thing. But that was the way one of the ways they entertain people. They'd mimic you. They would follow your movements and then mimic you. And it was an annoyance to you, but it was funny to everybody else. He says, mimic me as I mimic Christ. Now, if you happen to be online watching or somebody here, you know, I don't know all of your walks. I know we all look very mature on the outside, but some of us on the inside struggle. And if you need help and you need to mimic somebody to get back on path, make sure you choose somebody who has a walk. Don't ever choose somebody based on a gift. That's not a good reason. Well, they're just really good teachers. Yeah, there's, good teachers don't mean good walks. But they're great worship leaders. Yeah. Just because you got the gift doesn't mean you have the maturity. I've, I've seen some phenomenal worship leaders. I mean, the best I've ever seen. And their walks were horrible. I mean, almost questionable as a Christian. Aside, aside from the grace of God, I would have to say, I don't even know if they're a believer. But I'll promise you that when they, this person would sing, it was like nothing I've ever heard in my life. The anointing that this person had was beyond anything I've ever heard. I've heard Hillsong Live brought, put Hillsong to shame. I've heard Lauren Daigle, Mercy Me. I've heard all the big names. And I mean, when this person would worship, it was something different. And when the, the Spirit of God would just crush you in the, in the most beautiful way, but this person's walk was just trash, unfortunately. I don't know where this person is at today. Lord willing, they're serving God the way they ought to be with such a gift they should be. But we never want to rely on a gift to imitate somebody. We want to rely on something like maturity. When we talk about discipleship, because discipleship is necessary in the body, it's the same concept. You want to make sure you're being discipled by somebody who has a walk, who is grounded, not just knowledgeable, but somebody that lives the walk. You want to know why most kids go astray in the faith? Not always, but most. is because of hypocrisy in the home. We hear the teaching, we see the teaching. Well, we don't see it. We hear the teaching, we hear the teaching, we hear the teaching, but then we see other things taking place. If you go talk to most kids on campuses, hypocrisy in the home or in the church is why people walk away from Christ. Hypocrisy. Make sure that you put yourself under somebody who's not a hypocrite. Somebody who's not saying one thing and living another. Make sure that the person that you choose to imitate, should you need help getting on track, is somebody with unquestionable character. Somebody that hands down is, I mean, a validated godly man or woman. But better yet, get to the point where you have your walk with the Lord. And you're not dependent on mimicking anybody. That's where you really want to be, where you and your walk with Jesus is all that is needed, nothing else. You don't need the pastor, you don't need the worship leader to help you walk with Jesus. You have that walk all on your own. What do you go to church for then? Because we still fellowship and you can still learn. Church is great, but your walk with the Lord is yours and that's something you must maintain. But if you can't walk, then follow Paul's example. Now, I always love mentioning this because here Paul tells the Corinthians, be imitators of me as I also am of Christ. To the immature church, he says that. When we are in the, if we ever get to the book of Ephesians, the, the rapture may happen. You never know what God's going to do. I don't know. But should we ever get to the book of Ephesians, they're a mature church. They're very mature. They're grounded. They're gifted. They got everything going for it that a good church should have. And they appear to have their ducks in a row for the most part. No church is perfect. Paul has a plea to the church of Ephesus. And it's not imitate me as I imitate Christ. He tells them something different. He says, follow God. And I love that. Because that's the plea to the mature belief. If you're not mature, you imitate me as I'm. Let me help you walk. Let me help you walk. To the mature believer, hey, don't follow me. You follow Christ. I want to make sure that's sealed in our heads. All right, now we can get into the actual chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly the traditions just as I deliver them to you. Now, honestly, I'm not sure if Paul is being genuine or sarcastic in that statement. If we remember, if we go back all the way to chapter 3, we remember that there were factions in the church. 
and that the Corinthians were divided. Some were of Paul, some were of Apollos, some were of Peter, some were of Jesus, and, and there was this big rift in the church, and everybody was, you know, one against another. They weren't seeing eye to eye, and some didn't want to be loyal to Paul. As we saw, actually many were against Paul. They didn't really care for Paul. I don't know what the full issue was because you know history doesn't disclose that to us. But there seems to have been an issue with Paul in the Corinthian church, and it doesn't tell us what it is. So when he tells us, "I praise you because you remember me in everything, and hold firmly the traditions just as I delivered them to you," I'm not sure if he's saying genuinely, "I'm so proud of you guys because you guys are doing everything I said." Because based on what we've seen, it appears they're doing everything except what he said. They're going astray in so many different directions. So he may be actually very sarcastic in this, but we do remember there were those of the church in Corinth who held closely to Paul's teaching. As a matter of fact, in chapter 7, we remember that somebody or some of the people from Corinth, they're writing to Paul. That's how this letter, Paul got all this information to write this letter because somebody delivered this to him. We have all these questions, Paul. We're, we don't know what's going on. We need help. And so he may be appealing to those who have remained faithful to his teaching, faithful to his apostolic Authority. I don't know. I can't tell you. So I, I will say this. I, have, of, I am of the mind that Paul is highly uh, sarcastic and sharp with his words. That's just my personal opinion. I've told you this before. I mean, I, I imagine Paul being somewhat kind of like myself. Not all of you are, have ever met my sarcastic side, but it's extremely sarcastic. Like, <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> I hold back so much now. But... It's very sarcastic, but that's what it is. Now, when Paul says here, I praise you, it's the Greek word epaneo. Now, epaneo isn't like the praise that you'd give to God. There's another word for that. This is to commend them. He's commending them, well, again, whether sarcastically or wholly genuine, I don't know. But he's commending them, having held firmly to the traditions as he delivered them. That's what he says. Can we go off of what he says? <clears throat> And Paul says in verse 30, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Now when he says, but I want you to understand, it appears that Paul is going to teach them something that he had not yet taught them. Because if there's something that they understood, if there's something they had been taught, then you would've, there would be no need to start off the address with, I want you to understand this. He doesn't start anything else in that nature. So it appears that there is these issues taking place in the church, and Paul wants to make something very clear to them, and he's going to do it, and he's going to make the case that we serve a God of order. Why would he need to bring the mention in that they serve a God of order? Well, because there was disorder in the church. So again, I want you to understand, Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Now, the first thing it says is Christ is the head of man. Christ being the Son of Man, we want, we want to never forget who Christ is. He's not just man, but he's God incarnate. But he was still man. Jesus was not 50% man and 50% God. He was 100% man, and he, was 100, he is 100% man, and he is 100% God. It's not this half and half. He was fully born in flesh. So it could never be undone. It was done, and it was necessary for the salvation of the world. He is also 100% deity. He always existed, always did, always will. In John 17, 5, he says, Father, glorify me again with the glory that I had with you before the world was. Jesus always was and always will be. But when he was born into humanity, he became 100% flesh. It's the reason Jesus wept. Jesus hungered. He thirsted. Jesus bled. He was able to die. Again, not a forever death, but he died for the moment. Again, to be resurrected to eternal life. And, you know, the Bible says he resurrected himself. It says the Spirit of God resurrected him. And it says the Father re resurrected him. You know, this triune aspect of the triune nature of God. But fully God, fully man. Him being the Son of Man, he is the head of mankind. More specifically, he is the head of his church. But he is it. He is the all in all concerning mankind. Hence, Christ is the head of man. And then he says, and man is the head of women. Now, I know women, that doesn't sound too appealing to you, especially if, you know, you've dated a loser or were married to a loser or are currently married to a loser. Hopefully I'm not a loser, babe, you know, but, you know, but I, I, I know that's not the most appealing things, appealing thing to hear often, you know, because a lot of men are lazy in the faith. 
Unfortunately, I mean, we look at this. We have two men in here, and the rest of you are ladies, including, I guess, my, myself and my son, but I'm the pastor. I don't count myself. I mean, we, we look at churches built throughout history, and they're built on women. I've never, I've never in my life heard of a church starting with men. Just, just I've never, even biblically, in, in the early days of Paul, the women gathered around the riverbank, and that's where they held church services, because in Paul's day, to, have, to hold a synagogue or a, something of that nature, because remember, I can't remember where Paul was, but the Jews were gathering together to learn, and the women wanted to know about Christ, and there wasn't enough men to be considered a synagogue, so they held it by the riverbank. Women, it's always been women. At the cross, women. At the tomb, women. The resurrection, women. The women, I mean, you guys are like the backbone of Christianity. You are that rib that was taken out of man or that side piece that holds man together, you know, because women are the backbone to the faith. Um, not unfortunately, but it's unfortunate that men don't. So I know when we hear things like women are the men, men are the head of women, it's not this appealing thing like, yeah. I mean, how, how many women in here don't want a man to lead them? How many women in here don't want a husband who's going to take charge and be the man of the household that God called them to be? Or, you know, if you were married, you felt that way at one point. Every woman does. It's innately within them. Women want to be led. That's, it's innately within you. Men, we want to lead. We're just lazy. <laughs> for, for lack of better words, men are lazy. We don't want to lead. We want to, but we don't want to. It's just, I would love to lead, but then I got to work. Women... Unfortunately, we are your head, which doesn't have to be a bad thing, but, you know. And then he says, and God is the head of Christ. Now, when he says God is the head of Christ, we definitely want to make sure that we understand something here. He's not desequating Christ's deity with the Father. What he's doing is he's setting forth an example. That example is not an inferiority to the Father, it's an order that was put in play. When Jesus was on this earth, when he was in his ministry, when he would teach, anything he did, one thing he made clear and certain is he was here to do the will of his father. Him and his father had a will in unison. Everything that he hears from the father, he does. Everything he hears from the father, he says. And you know, I may be taking a little bit of liberties in what I'm saying, but you, you get the point. Jesus made it clear that his will was to do the will of his father which should be the appropriate response if they truly are one and the same. If they are one in essence, then their will should coincide. Everything that the Father wants, Jesus should want. That's how that works. Now, if there was disunity, then there would be a clash of wills. But there's not disunity. They're one in essence. And so when it says here that God is the head of Christ, it's not that God is subjugated over Jesus and it's all God's way or no way. It's this authority that Paul's putting forward. And I believe the example here we're going to find is going to be to the ladies. And he's going to say, even as Christ submitted to his father, the example is going to be put forth. Women, submit to your husbands. Women, submit to the authorities that God has put before you. So make sure you understand it has nothing to do with superiority, but with order. Now he's going to use this example to establish the church. Now, Paul in verse 4, he's going, to, he's going to put the relevance of the culture into the church. We've talked about this before, and this is something where I believe churches lack, is they want to use the Bible to establish authority, but they forget that everything that was done in the Bible was done culturally. So we hear things like, today we're going to see head coverings. I know it's going to sound odd to us, and none of you ladies have your head covered. No, it's not what that means at all. There are those churches who will take those stances. And they'll make women wear dresses. They'll make you wear little headdresses. And they'll make you do all this nonsense that's ritualistic. You're laughing because you know a place like that. And I don't know what that place is, but when people start laughing like that, they've been a part of that or seen that. And they do that because they don't understand that what Paul is about to mention here was a cultural issue in Corinth. Let me give an example. Women and men in Judaism didn't cover their heads for to like the 500s AD. Men didn't wear yarmulkes. Women didn't often wear headdressing. Sometimes they did. I mean, they were they could. It wasn't a law issue. I spent a lot of time researching that to see when headdressings became appropriated in the Middle East. What, what brought that about? And it came way later. Now, there were those who did wear them. There was a benefit to wearing something over your head if you're standing out and, you know, the sun is beating on you. But for religious purposes had nothing to do with anything. 
So Paul's going to bring in, I don't like the word cultural appropriation in light of all the nonsense going on in our, our nation, but Paul is going to bring what's taking place in the culture, as we've seen in the sacrifices, and he's going to apply it to the scriptures. Now, let, let me show you what I mean here. In verse 4, he says, Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. Now, that's not biblical. You're not going to find that in the Law of Moses. You're not going to find that in the Tanakh anywhere. It's, it has nothing to do with anything. So why would Paul mention that? Because in the Greek culture, in the Corinthian lifestyle, for a man to approach God with a head covering was a disgrace. It wasn't a good thing. It was considered this, this unnatural thing. It was disgraceful. And a man, being the glory of man, was to approach the deity openly. And then look what he says here in verse 5. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Again, that all just sounds like a bunch of nonsense, but we're going to learn culturally, culturally the importance of what Paul is saying. So the woman he's saying is to have her head covered because the woman was not to approach a deity with a, cup, with a head uncovered. Now, why, you might ask? First, let's understand the culture of the Roman Empire right away. What was taking place in the Roman Empire, and we've talked about this about two months ago, is there was a feminist movement in the Roman Empire. It was actually really similar to the American feminist movement today. Women were tired of being the house bodies. They were tired of being slaves to their husband, so to speak. They were tired of raising the family while the husband went out to work. They were tired of being treated somewhat second class. And women started revolting. They started rebelling. And one of the ways women would rebel is they would uncover their head. And in the Corinthian culture, that was a disgrace. Again, it's not a Jewish thing, but we see this same thing take place in places like Turkey. That's why, you know, or, or in the Islam, that's why the women wear the, what are they called? The, um, can't think of it for the life of me. The burqa. That's why women wear the, it's a disgrace to allow your hair to be seen by another man, especially after marriage. And it's considered more a, a sexual thing. And so to be proper, you had your head covered when you prophesied or prayed. Now, I don't know if they had to wear head coverings throughout society like the Muslims do, but for sure when they approached God, it was a sign of humility and respect. And it was a disgrace for a woman to approach and pray or prophesy culturally with her head uncovered. More so, these women that were in this feminist movement, they left their husbands. Many of them would leave their husbands. They would leave their children, and they'd go off into the workforce. And they would often, as a sign of rebellion, shave their head. They, they wanted to look like a man, and they wanted to have the responsibility of a man. They wanted to be considered equal with men. Now, when these women would do things such as this, it often would result in homosexuality. Which we shouldn't be shocked because we see that in our culture today. These women, they go off, they, shave, they forsake, they leave their husbands, leave their kids, go do something crazy like shave their head and end up with another chick. And my wife and I were actually talking about this this morning. The oddest thing when women do that is they always end up with a girl that acts like a guy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. You go off to be a lesbian, but you date a chick that acts and looks like a dude. You had an actual genuine man. What was the problem? You know, like that you want to date a girl who, who's trying to act and look like a dude it's the false it's the fake thing and you have the real thing right. it's like you know you can eat a real apple or you go eat the plastic apple off the table well, the plastic apple looks shinier but it's fake what's wrong with you but that's what was happening in the Roman Empire now one of the issues with the shaved head culturally again it often resulted this type of lifestyle and attitude resulted in lesbianism or, or homosexuality more so a shaved head in this culture was representative of a prostitution that's what prostitutes did they shaved their head that's one of the ways they identified as a prostitute so Paul is looking at what's going on in the church and he's hearing what's going on in these women and their freedom in Christ and they're free to uncover their heads it's not that approaching the Lord in prayer like ladies, it's not that you praying or prophesying with, with your head uncovered is this evil thing. It's in that culture the way it was viewed. It's the same concept as the sacrifices. Is the sacrifice anything? Anybody? No. It's, it's, the gods aren't real. They're fake. Okay, but let's pretend like Margaret here is brand new to the faith. 
She doesn't know anything about Jesus. She's hearing what she's hearing and she's liking it. But then we got Trish here who has her head uncovered and she starts praying. Margaret doesn't know anything about the freedom of Christ, but she does know the Corinthian culture and that she knows that it's a disgrace for that. And so she sees Trish doing this and all she thinks is, well, this, this isn't good. What's wrong with this church? How could they act like this? And then let's say, let's say uh, Lisa, my mother-in-law, walks in with her head shaved. Margaret's even, she's a prostitute. She's a prostitute serving Jesus. That's all she understands. That's what she understands and knows. So she starts freaking out. Now she wants nothing to do with this because we're more messed up than the world. We claim to be the way and we're over here all messed up. We've forsaken basic values of the Corinthian culture. <clears throat> Not that, that a shaved head is anything or an uncovered head is anything, but to them it was something. It's like this. Would it be proper for me to walk around all day and all night without my wedding ring on? Would it be improper? Well, what's, the more, what's more proper? To have it on or to have it off? Why? What's the, it's just a ring. Who cares about it? It's just, it's just a ring. My attitude is way more important, right? And that would be true. But what's the significance of this ring? To let others know I'm, it's to bear witness to the covenant that I made to my wife before God. So in our culture, we wear these, and to not wear your wedding ring is considered disrespectful. It's considered a sign of disgrace. I mean, you're being disgraceful to your wife or your spouse at that point. That's our culture. They don't, I mean, if, if they hurt us in our rings, they think we're stupid. We think they're stupid with their head. This is what, what same concept to them. This is a big deal to our culture. When I see people without their wedding rings and they tell me they're married, I'm like, well, where's your ring, bro? How do you signify to the world, how do you signify to another lady not to hit on you? How do you, I mean, it doesn't mean that they can't or they won't, but it's you doing your part to show the world that I've made a covenant with my spouse. Concept is the same. For them, the head covering was a sign of honor when you prayed or prophesied. And to have your head uncovered was dishonorable. More so to have your head shaved was a sign of prostitution. So for a woman in the church to have her head shaved was to identify with the prostitute. Let's think of it like this. How would you guys say if somebody came in here, they got saved, and they came out of prostitution, right? And for the next two years, they're just growing, and they light on fire for Christ. They stop prostituting. No more prostitution for them. But every week they walk in with a skirt so high you can see their butt cheeks. And a shirt so low you can see their cleavage. What would you guys say to that? Would you guys have issues with that? I would have an issue with that. Head shaved. Same concept. That was how they identified with the prostitute. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. So Paul's telling them there's a really big issue here. And not that your freedom in Christ is void or invalid, but you want to act and appropriate yourself in such a way that your testimony isn't diminished. Hence, Paul, that whole last chapter, he's talking like, well, bro, if it's going to be an issue eating meat, and if my testimony is going to be dwindled away, and it's going to be a hindrance for me to give the gospel out, I won't eat meat. I will be what you need me to be so that the gospel of Christ may further, so that the, there's no hindrance to anybody coming to the Lord. This was a hindrance to people coming to the Lord. The world looking on in, all they see is insubordination and disorder. It's kind of like the church today. How many people who aren't believers really want to be a part of Christianity? Well, not a whole lot of them. Why? Because they look from the outside in and they see disorder, disunity. Christians are always fighting and acting stupid. Do you blame unbelievers for not wanting to come around? I don't always blame them. Sometimes I'm like, there go us Christians again. And it's usually just a handful of select Christians that are acting foolish but they, they always end up representing the whole body. So that's what's taking place here. And he says in verse five, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman who has her head shaved. Verse six, for if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off, <clears throat> Or her head shaved, let her cover her head. And his point in that is, you guys should have already pieced that together yourself, is to prophesy and pray in the church with your head uncovered is, you, you're, is, is the same type of rebellion as prostitution. If we remember in 1 Samuel 15, God speaking to Paul and he tells them that uh, 
that disobedience is the same as witchcraft or rebellion is the same as witchcraft. You guys remember that? That's one of those more, you know, potent verses that when you hear that, it's like, whoa. Rebellion is as the sin of divination or witchcraft. That's nuts. That means to rebel is like witchcraft. Paul takes it a step further and says to rebel is to be a prostitute in this sense. To do what you're doing is no different than being a prostitute out there. And that's Paul's case here. So he says it's better to have your head covered. Verse 7, For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. So he says the man is not to have his head covered. So Paul is going to bring in a theological aspect in this. He says the man ought not to, be, to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God. Now, when we remember man being created in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, it gives a retelling of the account from a more intimate stance. God gives Adam sovereignty over creation. He says, it's all yours, man. Have a blast. Tend the garden tells us he brings the animals forth and he names has Adam name them and all this is done before a woman is ever created so I believe when Paul says here that for, for he is the image and the glory of God that's his reference point as a matter of fact I want to turn to Genesis chapter 2 quickly <clears throat> Genesis 2 if you don't know where Genesis is it's the very first book of your Bible <clears throat> chapter 2 should be the, like in the first pages but Genesis chapter 2 Go to verses 18, and just because it's a good passage, I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. It's, it's not much. But in Genesis 2, verse 18, he says, Then Yahweh God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, Yahweh God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at, the place, at that place. Yahweh God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she, be, she shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So it appears, not it appears, Adam was alive for, it doesn't tell us how long before Eve was brought forth. And so when he says that man was made in the image of God and the glory of God, I believe that's his reference point. When man was created, he was created directly in the image of God. When God created Eve, she was taken out of man, to, and she was made for man. Adam was made for God. Woman was made for man. Now, not diminishing any woman's, you know, I don't want to use the word authority. I'm, I'm what's sort of looking for um, value. You guys are every bit as intrinsic, intrinsically valuable as a man is. You guys are viewed by God no different than we are. You are loved by God no less than we are. You are mankind just like we are. But in the initial creation account, Adam was created for God. Woman was created for man. And both were to come together as one flesh to be for God. Does that make sense? Yes. Hopefully that makes sense. I know that can be a little bit of a spin in the mind. But that's what it is. And it almost sounds diminishing, but it's not. It's beautiful and it's glorious. And it is, it is the order in which God created. And I'm sure there's a feminist possibly watching this out there saying, I can't believe he just said that. That makes us women less. No, that's just a foolish woman speaking that says that. Not understanding that God creates with order and purpose. It never says woman was created less than man. As a matter of fact, it says, when it says yeah, God took of a rib, the actual Hebrew word is just God took from his side. And I love what Matthew Henry says. God took woman from man's side for a purpose, so that she would be equal with him. She didn't take from his head so that she would be above him. Or he didn't take from man's feet so that she would be below him. But from his side next to his heart so that she'd be near to him and equal with him. And I love that. And I totally paraphrase that. But the concept remains. So it's not a diminishing thing to women, but it is the way in which creation was ordered. It's how God saw fit to do. So he says, he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Verse 8, for man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. 
For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, this is going to be interesting because the whole angels thing is... But first, let's get to the point that he made. You know, we've already covered man was created for God, woman was created for man, and there's this authority and this order that takes place. And he says, because of that order, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority. What were the women doing at this point? They were rebelling. They were acting in insubordination. They were rebelling against the authority of the male. Why is that an issue? Because of God's creational order. There, there, there must always be order. In our culture, that's not the way order with when men and women are. I, honestly, I'm not sure exactly how our culture works in that area because I just, I'm going to be honest, I don't really know. America is so whitewashed and watered down. It's, I'm sure 50, 60 years ago, it was a much more vivid distinction. And today, I guess we're so far gone in the feminist movement that that order is almost impossible to see. But one of the ways women submit to the order of their husband is they submit, you know, the, I'm going to say the way my wife submits to me. She trusts that God is going to lead her through me. She trusts that the decisions that God puts on my heart are the decisions that God is making for our family. She trusts that I am in the word of God and I am in prayer and that my walk with God is where it should be so that God would lead our family. And even in times of disagreement, she trusts that God is leading me to lead our family. Now I know... Like in the world, I don't know how that looks for the world's sake, but in the Christian realm here in America, that's what order would look like. Now, for somebody like Trish, you're not married, or Margaret, you're not married. Well, what does order look like for you? Because it appears that it's more than just a husbandly order, but it's an order of male over female. So an example, I am your pastor. I don't have to be your pastor. I'm your pastor because you guys have chosen to come here. And me being your pastor, there is an authority that I have in the word of God that you ought to submit to. Now, one thing I want to make clear and a distinction with, pastors don't have the authority to tell you how to live. I can't tell you, go, you know, if you're go join, join Jehovah's Witness, they'll make you throw away your TV. That's not a pastor's job. Um, some pastors want to play God in your life. That's not my job to play God in your life. It's my job to be a spiritual authority. And you do well and you're wise to submit to that authority if you've placed yourself under it. Now, in the Christian church, you're not bound to your pastor. You're welcome to go put yourself under another pastor. But when you put yourself under an authority, operate under that authority and trust that God is going to work in that authority through your life. So let me give you an example. If I told you, Trish, you need to sell your truck and go buy something else, that's not my place. I would discard that. I have no authority to tell you what to do with your possessions. Now, Trish, if I see you messing up spiritually and I address you spiritually, that is an authority that you do well to listen to because God has given me that authority in your life because you are here. Does that make sense? So when he tells the women here, therefore, women ought to have a symbol of authority, that's what that would look like for us today. Now, you guys are all, after service, you're welcome to give me any other opinions you have because I'm open to them because I'm sure there's things that you guys see with these concepts that I probably don't. But what I do want to touch here is when he says that they should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, there's a lot of commentary on this and there's a lot of opinion on this. And not everybody exactly agrees and nobody knows exactly what this means because when Paul said this, it appears it was just... I don't know what he was talking about. He, did, he didn't explain himself. I don't know if there was something that he taught in one of his visits to the church of Corinth about angels that you know we don't have because he just kind of throws that out there and then it's just there. And So I'm going to tell you what I think it means, what I believe it means. In light of the context of rebellion and insubordination, if we remember there was a rebellion that took place amongst the angels and a third of the angels rebelled against God and in order... I don't know if he's even in an attempt to overthrow God. I don't. I, I mean, when you're going to battle God, I don't think you get a chance to get that far to even make much of a game plan because he's God. But nonetheless, they rebelled against God and they were cast out of heaven. They were cast, you know, out of the presence of God or you get the point. We call them demons now. Satan and his angels, as, as Jesus would refer to them. In light of the insubordination and the rebellion taking place in the Corinthian church, he mentions these angels. And I believe the point that he's making is, if God did not spare his angels who rebelled against him, should we be so foolish so as to oppose 
him and suppose that he will not spare us in our rebellion. So let me give you, let me give you an example. A rebellious heart is not evidence of a believer. Now, it doesn't mean that a believer can't be rebellious. Uh, obviously, that's going to be something between God and that believer. I don't know. But I will say this, that a rebellious believer is a contradiction. We're not called to be rebellious. We're called to be obedient. Not to me. You're called to be obedient to the Lord. And so when we start acting in, in, in a means of disobedience and rebellion, when we start rebelling against authority, when we start rebelling in such a way that it becomes a hindrance to the gospel of Christ... We have to ask ourselves the question, if God didn't spare the angels, would God spare you or me? Now, again, I don't, I'm just throwing that out there because Paul threw that in here. And it's almost as if, I don't know, I have no other way to take that. That's the only thing the angels are representative of. And so I, I believe that's the point that Paul's making. If God would not spare the angels who were once sinless, what makes us think God would spare us if we chose to rebel against him? Now, realize what rebellion is. Rebellion isn't sin. Remember what sin is, right? Sin is the accidental, I messed up. Rebellion is going to be this willingly transgressing God. So just, just for reminder's sake, sin, miss the mark. Comes from the term of archery, when you're shooting your bow and arrow, you're trying to hit the bullseye, and you missed. You missed the mark. Harmatia, you sinned. Transgression or rebellion... You went to shoot the bullseye, but you missed on purpose for whatever your reason was. You liked the way the number 10 dot looked better than the bullseye. Somebody paid you to miss, and so you did it for those purposes. Whatever the point is, you missed on purpose. Rebellion is to rebel intentionally. It's an intentional, I know what you said, God, and I know what your word says. I'm going to do this anyway. Because whatever fleshly desire we want to fulfill at that moment. Now, I'm just throwing that out there. Now, I actually want to make another turn. I should have told you to stay in Genesis because I want to go to Genesis chapter 3 now. I want you to see something in Genesis 3. Go to Genesis 3, verse 16. The fall just took place, or sin just happened. The fall just happened. Man and woman, Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit. God was coming through the garden. They hid themselves. They had their fig leaves on. God sees them and calls them out. And God starts pronouncing judgment on them for their rebellion against him. And in verse 16, he says something to the woman. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, when it says your desire will be for your husband, the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, the idea is your desire will be to rule over your husband. Some, in, in the very same essence that the Corinthian women are doing here, they're rebelling against that authority. They're, kind of, they're taking their own authority into their power and saying, we basically, your authority, we have our own authority in Christ now. That's been the issue since the fall. That's been the issue since the fall. Women, it's in you guys, whether you like it or not. It's very few women don't have that desire to rule, and they are true godly women that just want to submit to their husbands and submit to the will of the Lord. doesn't make you guys pushovers. My wife is the most submissive person to me I know, and she's the most intelligent person that I know. And I rely on her insight on everything I do before I make a decision. She's the first and last person I go to. Well, God is. But you know, physically... So it's not the diminishing of, but women have this desire to want to rule over the man. It's what it is. It's in you guys. It's the sin nature of the human being. It's why so many marriages fail. Especially when the man starts to slack, what's the first thing the woman wants to do? Take the reins. If you're not going to drive this, then I will. When the first thing the woman should do is she should go to her knees and go to God and be like, Lord, will you put this dude in check? He's going to wreck us. But women innately, they want to take charge because women, you guys are smarter than us. That's why women, I believe, live longer than men. Women are smarter. I mean, I would not disagree with that to any degree. Women are smart. There's, no, there's nothing stupid about women. They're very intelligent people. That actually makes more sense that women would lead, which is why I believe women don't lead. Because when men lead and are successful, God gets the glory. If a woman leads and is successful, we say it's because she's a woman. 
Because it makes sense. Well, of course. They're more, they're more rounded out. They have a way better view on things. They're more rational with things. Typically, not always. Some women are extremely irrational, but you get the point. And so again, I believe that's the whole point that Paul is making here. You know, from the get-go, women have always had this desire to be over the husband. And in the Corinthian church, we see a full-out rebellion where they're just rebelling against the authority. And he says, because of the angels, you guys ought to have this authority. In verse 11, he says, However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. And so Paul gives an order of equality. He says, men and women are both necessary to one another. Woman, you guys can't exist without us. Men, we can't exist without you. We are necessary for each other. And again, this is how the women of Corinth would have taken this. This is how the feminists of today would take this. You just want to subjugate yourself. You're a chauvinistic male. And there's all these like these 52 words that women use on how men are bad, 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 bad guys. And how we just want to oppress women. No, Paul says, look, we're both necessary. Can you imagine if women stopped playing their part fully? If women, if you didn't do your part, life would cease to exist. Men, if you didn't do your part, life would cease to exist. For those feminists that want to remove men completely, you guys will be, the world will be dead in one generation. Kill off every man and you guys can't survive. You're going to live off of clones. <laughs> Come on. They're both necessary. That's Paul's point in these two verses. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman. Here's the big part. And all things originate from God. Women, you come from us. Men, we're born from you. We belong to God. Stop trying to make it a me versus you deal. We belong to God. Stop looking at me. I'll stop looking at you. Let's both look to the Lord. How would the Lord have this operated and willed? You know, when you do it God's way, things operate the way they were intended to operate. And it operates smoothly. If I start looking at Trish and Trish starts looking at me, when we start bumping heads and having issues, you know what we're not doing? The will of God. You know who we're not following? The Lord. You know what we are doing? Causing issues in the church. We are to operate in the order that God set forth. Just because I'm a man and just because I'm the pastor doesn't make me over Trish. Doesn't make Trish under me in, in the sense of humanity. She is every bit as much of daughter of God as I am a son of God. But in this context, God has given me an authority over her. Speaking of the word of God, but not humanitar humanitarily speaking. She's, she's not less of a human. She's not less important. She's not less significant. She's every bit as much cherished and loved and significant before the Lord as I am. But if she wants to follow the Lord, she's going to submit to my pastoralship within the context of the church. And if I want to be in right with God, I'm going to treat her as a daughter of the king and I'm not going to overlook her and do anything to harm her. You see how that works? And when we do it God's way, it's this beautiful dance of life that takes place where everybody wins. When we oppose God and do it our way, we just mess everything up and then we look like the church looks today. Just a mess. And just full of chaos. And verse 14 or verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is to be a dishonor, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Now he tells them to judge for yourselves if this is proper. You judge. Kind of like I told you guys earlier. Judge me right now. Is it proper for me to walk around without a wedding ring? Or is it improper? And we all, I mean, you guys all look like you agreed it's proper to wear it. Why is it proper for me to wear it? Because I'm married. Is it proper for the woman to have a head covering or is it not? Well, the question is, is it going to be a hindrance to people looking from the outside in? Is it going to be a hindrance for people coming to the gospel? Well, the answer we know is yes. So is it proper for the woman to wear a head covering in Paul's context? It is. Why? So that the gospel of Christ would not be hindered. So that it's not going to be an issue for Margaret coming to Christ. 
You know, as Margaret gets older in the faith and matures, she'll be able to say, oh, why do we wear head coverings? We don't need these anymore. Whereas once she was shook up by the fact that a woman would not wear a head covering. So we want to make sure whatever route we take, that the route we're taking isn't a hindrance to the gospel. It says, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, when he says it's the nature, it's the innate nature within the human being. Let me give you an example. There's three dudes in here. Your hair's a little long, but it's, re it's really not that long, comparatively speaking. Naturally, men gravitate towards shorter hair. Throughout history, men have gravitated towards shorter hair. Doesn't mean that men haven't had long hair. But the natural course of a man is, we don't want long hair. I, even me, I'll grow my hair out every so often, and one day you guys are going to see me with long hair, and then I'm going to get frustrated and chop it off because it's going to annoy me. Because the natural inclination of man is, we, it's, the nature is to have short hair. I know we all have this idea that Jews in Jesus' day had long hair. That's not true. The priests were required to have certain lengths of hair, but the, the average Jew did not have long hair. Jesus very possibly didn't have long hair. Maybe hair kind of like my father-in-law's, maybe shorter like ours. But keep in mind, like shoulder-length hair is not considered long. This is probably properly what many Jews did have. I mean, my hair's combed. Their hair would look all not quite as nice as mine, but... And it was the natural innateness within women to want to have long hair. Long hair on women is beautiful. Long hair on guys is grungy. You know, it's true. Like my wife, she likes her short hair, but I love her long hair. It's beautiful. I love my wife's hair long. I don't care for her hair being short. She still looks beautiful, but when her hair is long, it's just like, it's gorgeous. It's, I love it. And women, most of you guys like your long hair too. That's why you guys have long hair. Nobody makes you have long hair. Look, Grace cut her hair kind of short. But naturally, women want to have long hair. It's an innate thing within you. Why? I don't know. That's Paul's point. It's nature. So, so not only are you women rebelling against the authority, but in essence, he, not that you ladies are rebelling against nature, but he's throwing this at them as kind of like just a kick in the butt. As a little, you know, you, know, you kick somebody when they're down. Again, Paul is very Paul. We'll just leave it at that. And I believe this is his way of just on the ground, and not spitting at them. That's kind of a mean thing to say. But again, it is, does not nature even teach that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Verse 16, but if one is inclined to be contention, contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. Now, this, this, so the way he leaves this off is there's nothing left to say. Basically, I've said what I've had to say. I've given you my reasonings for what I've said. If one continues to be contentious, if somebody still wants to stir the pot, if they still want to cause strife and issues, I have no other direction to point them. That's all. That's what he says. He says, there's, I have no other point to direct them in this matter. That's it again, verse 16. He says, but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. And we're going to end there. But Paul's point remains true in the church today. If people remain to be contentious, there's only so far that myself as a pastor, there's only so much I can do. I suppose at some point you just ask somebody to leave if they're going to be a hindrance to the gospel. I'll tell you right now, if people come in and they're a hindrance to the teaching of God, if they're going to be a hindrance to the gospel going out, if they're going to be a hindrance to the faith, I will ask somebody to leave. Never had to do it. I hope I never have to do it. I will do it. Don't want to do it, but I will. As a matter of fact, this last week, I had a very uncomfortable dealing because I'm a barber, and one of my clients decided that they wanted to uh, challenge me, I suppose. So I cut hair, and I cut only who I want to cut. That's just how I work. I, I don't let people come in unless I like you. And if I don't like you, I don't cut your hair. I'm at a place in my life where I can do that. And I'm well enough known in the barber world that I can do that. And I have enough people lining up to get haircuts that I don't need more people. As a matter of fact, that's what I had to tell this person is they came at me and they were super late for their appointment. And I told them I might have to skip one of you guys. And the wife went off the rails and I said, hey, let me make sure you understand something. Don't ever threaten to leave because I'll kick you out and you won't come back. I got four people that'll take your spot today. <laughs> and they shut up and got real 
And when people get contentious, sometimes you have to put the foot down. And as Paul would say here, if they continue to be contentious, we have nothing left to say on this matter. And if people want to continue to be insubordinate and they want to hindrance the gospel, then we will ask them to go. And if you want to come back, we'd love for you to come back. Don't be a hindrance to the gospel. Now, ladies, nobody in here is a hindrance to the gospel. I mean, you guys are all awesome, you know. I'd imagine that, you know, kicking somebody out of a fellowship would be one of the hardest things in the world to do. And I'm going to let you know if I ever had to do that, it would have to be a necessary thing. I would never want to put somebody out. The goal is always to see somebody mature, to see, see, see somebody restore. But one thing that we don't allow in the church is we don't allow contention. We don't allow strife. We're not going to allow divisions to take place in the name of Christ. If there is divisions, they happen. What we do is we reunite. We bring together. We restore. If there's fights and contentions, they happen. I'm okay with them happening. They restore. But if they continue, if restoration is not in the cards, well, I mean, even Jesus would say, Matthew 18 would agree with me on that. But that's the teaching today, today, you guys. You know, it's a rough teaching. It's one of those ones that wasn't comfortable for me, especially because there's a bunch of women in here. But I would encourage you, ladies, don't ever feel that you're beneath anybody. You're not. You're a daughter of God. You guys are princesses in the king's eyes. But be faithful daughters. Be obedient daughters. Do it God's way. Sometimes you're not going to like it God's way because God's way often goes against our fleshly nature. Same with men. We're men. We're sons of the king. We are princes in the king's eyes. Do it God's way. Where we mess up as men often is we overstep our authority. We want to be more assertive in our authority than God has given us. And a, a true authority figure in Christ is not one who's assertive and who overpowers with a heavy hand, but it's one who is loving and gentle and kind and leads and guides and corrects and edifies and builds up. It's like Jesus. It's what he did. So, Father, we thank you for being God. We thank you that you are who you are, that you're loving, that you're kind, that you're good, Lord. Teach us men to be like you in this manner, Father, that we would be true authority figures in your name, that we would lead by example, that we would lead with your authority of peace, with your authority of love. And at times, with your authority, Lord, to discipline. I pray for the women, Lord, that are listening to this teaching that you would uh, create in them a clean heart, Lord, a fresh vision to walk in your will, Lord, to do things your way, to not allow their flesh or the enemy to put anything in their ears that's going to cause a hindrance to their walk with you. I pray for each of us that we would die to ourselves, Lord, that right now we would just put ourselves to death and that we would allow you to be the life in us, that we would walk your will your way. Be with us this week as we go forward, Lord. Hold our hand, Lord. In Jesus' name.